Protecting or endangering, Kenyan police stand accused of crimes ranging from corruption to torture and murder. But could the high-profile killing of a self-exiled Pakistani journalist reveal more than just misconduct? I'm Andrea Sankin. Today's newsmaker is corruption in Kenya's police. Well, law enforcement is supposed to protect us and keep us safe. But what happens when the police are the ones committing the crimes? It's a global problem, but for years, Kenya's police have been accused of using excessive force, ignoring protocol, and even executions. One case that's grabbed global headlines is the death of Pakistani journalist Arshad Sharif near Nairobi. Police initially said he was shot after failing to stop at a roadblock. Then they claimed it was a tragic case of mistaken identity concerning a suspected stolen vehicle. But now, according to Kenya's citizen media, police claim they fired in self-defense after an occupant in Sharif's car shot at them first, injuring an officer. All that is mysteriously missing from the police report filed October 23rd. Meanwhile, Pakistan says it will carry out its own investigation, sending a team of top security officials to Kenya. Aj. Today, I have decided that we will form a high-level judicial commission to investigate the matter transparently and will put in a request for an Islamabad High Court judge for this. So while Kenyan and Pakistani-led investigations get underway, there is plenty of speculation elsewhere as to why Arshad Sharif was shot. Some, including Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan, believe it was a targeted killing meant to silence a journalist critical of Pakistan's government and the military. He knew his life was in danger. He'd received threats repeatedly. I told him, but he was not scared and never turned his back from the righteous path. His was a targeted killing, whatever people say, but I know his was a targeted killing. Well, so far, there's no solid evidence to prove Arshad Sharif was assassinated. But what is known is that the issue of police brutality and corruption is widespread. Missing Voices Kenya actively monitors police killings in the country. Now, it's found that since 2007, there have been 1,286 deaths at the hands of law enforcement. 100 of those took place just this year. But it doesn't end there. In the past 15 years, there have also been at least 241 enforced disappearances. President William Ruto has been under immense pressure to tackle the issue. Earlier this month, he disbanded the country's special services unit. It's a force accused of torture and murder and suspected in the deaths of two Indian nationals working on the president's political campaign. In January 2022, the authority launched investigations into the incidents in which 25 dead bodies were recovered from Rivayara in Siaya County on diverse dates. Having attended all the post-mortem examinations, the general emerging trend as cause of death was determined as, out of these bodies, 12 had had injuries. Well, it's not a secret that Kenyan police forces have acted with impunity in the past, so could it happen again in the high-profile and dramatically complicated case of Arshad Sharif? Joining me now to discuss that and more are all from Nairobi, Otsieno Namwaya, he's East Africa Director for Human Rights Watch, and John Allen Namu is the co-founder of the independent media house Africa Uncensored. Thanks so much for being with us. You know, Otsieno, we know investigations are far from complete, but uh, there have been some facts gathered in the shooting of Arshad Sharif that they really are disturbing, not least uh, that the police general service unit, the GSU, has changed its version of events almost 180 degrees now. First, it was an accident and uh, a case of mistaken identity. And now uh, it's a case of self-defense because they say they were shot at first. How is that kind of inconsistency possible? Well, um, it sounds improbable. But uh, for somebody who has kept track of um, the actions of Kenyan police, uh, the kind of impunity and the inability to even just give the correct version of events where a killing has happened, it's not exactly very surprising. 
uh, it raises very, very um, pertinent issues, some of which we have raised for the last 10 years about the, the police use of excessive force, which they have done for over a decade now or more, and the very blatant lack of uh, accountability for the police who do that, despite the fact that after the 2010 constitution was put in place, there are very uh, clear institutions of accountability that were supposed to ensure police uh, accountability where such a thing happens. But for now, for example, police will be saying we are now going to investigate, but in the process they change the statements, interfere with the evidence, with impunity, and in the end, you will have you will find that nobody actually is held to account in the long run. Okay, that's discouraging. But I mean, as for this massive discrepancy in the reports so far, you, you think that could actually be down to what, incompetence? No, it's a very deliberate strategy because if you look at what they are currently saying, uh, a change, a shift from the initial uh, version of events, they are actually saying that prior to the killing, the chief of the area where he was shot had informed the residents that there was a, a car that had been stolen. Uh, and a child, um, a car had been stolen and taken off with a child who had been kidnapped and was heading into the area. That is very, very unusual because usually where a kidnapping and carjack has happened, police do not deal through the chiefs uh, because the chiefs are under the Ministry of Interior who, who do not take orders from the police. The police are supposed to be under the Ministry of Interior, but they operate independently from the Ministry of Interior. How that kind of signal reached the chief, and usually even if the chief got to hear of it, rarely would they broadcast to the uh, to the residents. Because who knows, the residents could be there uh, among um, the, the, the victim, the, sorry, the culprit could be among the residents. Mm -hmm. Why was that kind of statement broadcast? And is this kind of uh, version of events credible? Right. My I, thinking is that it is not credible. It's not credible. And I, I'm just curious because they say one of their own was shot uh, f by an occupant in Sharif's car. Where is that injured officer? Uh, uh, that's, that's an important question. But also, why is it coming three days later? Mm. Because the, the shooting happened, at, I think, four days later on Sunday. And for the last three days, we have known that it was an accident. That statement was issued by a police person who is well known, and they have held on to that statement until three days later. Is when they realized that actually one of their own was shot, and that police officer who was shot has not been given to us so far. We have not been told that uh, when the shooting happened, uh, Sharif's car, uh, anybody in Sharif's car had a gun. I think he was being driven by a brother. There has been no indication that there was a disarming of the person who shot. Uh, at the police, this this is uh, these are just some of the discrepancies that raise questions right. about the credibility of the police version of events. So, I mean, John Allen, what does all of this tell you then about you know the state of the police and how difficult this investigation alone will be? I think what it tells you, like what, what Tiano said, is that there's a lot of difficulty in in being able to build trust between the police and the public if narratives can change so quickly. Um, and so drastically about something that's garnered international attention and should be um, a time when the police are at their best in terms of representing the country, uh, the country's investigative capacity, um, coming to this um, situation with clean hands and promising an investigation as they did um, earlier on. I mean, the, the, the holes in the story so far are so gaping as to make not just um, people here at home not believe the police version of events, but people in Pakistan as well. And what that's doing is that it's feeding a lot of misinformation and disinformation online about the motives around Arshad Sharif's uh, killing, which, of course, is still an open investigation. So mm -hmm. it, it really doesn't send any good signals about the police uh, or the police's capacity to investigate this crime. Right. And... Um... Yeah, we, we do have to stress, I mean, these investigations are nowhere near finished. But, you know, the, the talk around it from even the official level has already gone so far as to draw con conclusions. And, John Allen, now you actually have Pakistan sending a delegation to Kenya to investigate. First of all, does, does Kenya want that? And do you think it's actually good for transparency in this investigation? I 
I, I don't think any country wants um, officers from another country coming to do the work that their officers their officers should be able to do. I mean, it's it's just not a good look. But in terms of uh, transparency and openness, um, I'd, I'd say that the Kenyan the Kenyan police um, are in a situation where they're backed into a corner because of these inconsistencies and because of the prominence of Arshad Sharif, but more so because um, the directorate of it, of criminal investigations own officers at this moment are also under investigation. A number of them are also under investigation um, for being part of a unit that essentially uh, perpetrated extrajudicial killings, um, the use of excessive force, kidnappings, all sorts of crimes related to police excessive use of force have been pinned on this, on this particular unit. So they're not in a good situation right now. And politically speaking, it seems that there is some sort of... Uh, um, a beef, so to speak, between the executive and members um, of the DCI at this point in time. Mm. So it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good for Kenya. I don't think that any officer, any investigator worth his salt would want someone looking over their shoulders in their backyard. But I think they've been backed into a corner this time around. Right. And I mean, I don't think it's fair for either of you to answer this, but, uh, you know, there's questions around how the Pakistanis feel themselves about uh, Islamabad conducting an investigation. Um, Otsiano, let me come back to you, because if we do look at the, the action taken to curb, you know, police abuse and corruption, the notorious special services unit uh, was indeed disbanded by President Ruto. Do you think that was a positive step, or do these forces, you know, simply start to move into other branches of the police and security forces to continue with the same behavior? Uh, I really don't know whether what is happening right now, what the president and the, the executive are doing right, right now is an, a positive step. Uh, I think it looks to me more like a, a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, but what should have happened really was for the government to go back to what initially was the, the roadmap that was given after the 2010 constitution was passed that outlined the steps that needed to be taken to reform the police service. I think that some, a few of those steps were taken in 2011, 2012, up to 2014, uh, after which the government stopped the process. There was a vetting process where the police officers who were involved in rights violations like this one were supposed to be clearly vetted and removed from the force. The senior officers who are vetted or commanders who are vetted this kind of uh, uh, violations were also supposed to be uh, vetted and moved from the force. But what happened is that the government stopped that process, stopped the entire police reform process. And in fact, what people saw is that some of the officers who had been initially removed from the force after the vetting were actually returned either to the force or to the government. And that has undermined the reform process to this, to this point. Uh, and then the government then started moving to the accountability institutions like uh, the, the Independent Policing Oversight Authority, which is supposed to investigate these kind of cases, intimidating them and threatening to deny them funding. That meant that while undermining police uh, accountability mechanisms, the government was actually encouraging police to continue because they knew that in the, in the event that this kind of thing happens, nothing is actually going to happen to them. And therefore, that lack of accountability for the police has encouraged the police to, to, to do this kind of thing because they know that they can get away with it. So for right. me, I, I don't think that what is happening right now is really anything to be, to be encouraged about unless the government declares fully mm. that they want to go back to the reform process that had been started and fully ensure that the reform process is completed the way it was designed. So just quickly, when you look at the investigation going forward of, of Arshad Sharif, and the fact that a Pakistani delegation is being sent, I mean, how confident are you then that this investigation can be thorough and won't be affected by conflict of interests? Let's put it that way. Again, we really don't know, because we uh, first the qu first question to ask is, why was uh, Sharif in Kenya in the first place? What was he running away from in Pakistan? And if he went all the way from Pakistan, we hear he passed through uh, Dubai, then to London, then to Kenya, where apparently it looks like he has been uh, here for more than a month. And in, uh, looking at some of the things we understand he was trying to process, it looks like he was destined to stay here for, for a few more 
uh, months, he was actually planning for long-term stay. Why was he running away from Pakistan? And when Pakistan comes over to Kenya to, to, to apparently to talk to Kenya about investigations, what exactly are we supposed to make of that, uh, especially where there are questions about Pakistan, what exactly was going on to Sharif in Pakistan, and also there are questions in Kenya about the role of the Kenya police in the killing. We don't know exactly mm. what this means and whether it could lead to anything that could, be, that could ensure accountability. Right. So, John Allen, I mean, this is actually then, you know, it's much more than a murder investigation. It's, it's a diplomatic issue. It's a political issue. Um, so what's your take on how much potential competing interests could come into play and potentially skew the entire investigation? I think just from the fact that the stories are changing so early in, in this investigation, it tells you quite a bit about what kind of uh, competing interests might come into play to, to scuttle. Um, the, the finding, the getting to the truth, getting to the bottom of this issue. Um, where Otieno is, is um, um, rather, you know, reluctant to be hopeful about, um, about the changes that are taking place within the police force, I, I share similar sentiments because even with the, um, just go back to what's happening locally, even with the disbandment of the SSU, even with the investigations that are taking place, they are focused around one investigation of the disappearance of two people. Whereas Kenya has had a long history of extrajudicial killings and forced disappearances, kidnappings, excessive use of force, something that has been recorded time and again, the fact that there are officers within the police force who are currently serving, who have been indicted um, by the public um, for their participation in such crimes, tells you quite a bit about the status or the or, or, the, or the point of view of the police um, when it comes to investigating its own crimes. Mm. Um, I mean, there, there, there are, um, if you want to be optimistic about it, some, you know, some positive signals in that the current um, uh, director of the, uh, of the DCI himself was a director of the Internal Affairs Unit, which was investigating police officers' crimes, alleged crimes, um, that might be something to look forward to. But but still, given the track record, given the history, it's very difficult to say. Right. And um, again, on, um, on, um, on Arshad Sharif's uh, investigation and the, the participation of, uh, of a Pakistani delegation here, it's important, um, like Otiano said, to think about the fact that Arshad Sharif was under threat in Pakistan itself. Um, and this isn't just rumors. The, there's, there's actual documentation that proves this, mm. and that he was on the run um, um, uh, and seeking, you know, seeking essentially um, safety here, seeking sanctuary here in Kenya. The, right. the fact that yeah. that's an issue and, that, that and we should don't be something. Know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You're, you're describing not, you know, why there is so much room for so much suspicion on so many levels as to what really happened and could be the motives behind uh, his, his death. But you've also described, John Allen, you know, why police killings have actually been labeled an epidemic in Kenya. Because uh, it is, as you said, it's not just about these, these few high profile cases. There are hundreds of people. Um, so tell us on the ground level, you know, how vulnerable are police really to bribes and corruption? What institutionally needs to be fixed so that the police don't need or don't, don't need, don't want and aren't tempted to, if I can put it that way, uh, commit any crimes whatsoever, obviously, and just go by their mandate to protect the public? I think it, it starts with a review of the laws that um, empower the police. Um, it starts with um, reviewing uh, the police's own training policies, training manuals. But I think one important thing that if we are to believe President Ruto's um, um, statements about uh, the independence of the police, should be actually giving them um, independence in, in word and in deed. But um, that independence must be guided by, by certain steps that um, Otieno had mentioned. Proper vetting of police officers, both at junior and senior level, and completing the process, not just stopping somewhere where it becomes politically um, inconvenient. Mm -hmm. um, reviewing of training policies, reviewing of very old laws that have their, their heritage and their roots in colonialism, 
um, mm. to ensure that the police force starts to operate as a service that truly is um, um, working in defense and for the protection of the public. I think a final thing is, is really about the culture of policing in this country. That will take a, a much longer time, but with a demonstration of leadership and, a pol and the political will to be able to change the police, I think this can happen. Um, That's an I, encouraging I, to hear. Yeah, I'm reluctant to believe that it's, it's solely like an issue of pay that drives the police to go mm. and, and start seeking bribes. It is the fact that there is a power dynamic that exists between the police and the public that is not that 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 nobody can sort of intervene in to to ensure that the police are serving the public and they've exploited those gaps for quite a long time um, and created cartels and systems within the police force that then also feed senior police officers um, and and make them so ensconced in this, this in this current method of operation that there's little to no interest um, to reforming the police force. Right. But having said right. that, there are police officers that are, you know, um, that are honest, that do mm. serve, and they might even be in the majority, say, for these kinds of incidents. Right. Uh, you know, Otsieno, uh, yeah, police misconduct, though, and, and this corruption is something, I mean, for all the good police that are out there, the ones that are not good, they not only disrupt, I mean, they threaten... We're talking about mostly high-profile cases on this program today, but the truth is they threaten just Kenyans' everyday lives. I mean, how much does it cost average Kenyans to feel like they're not safe, to have to watch where they drive, where they conduct their business? I've heard they don't even want to stop at police roadblocks uh, because they know they'll be forced to, to pay a bribe or that they'll be hassled by police. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem, and it's, um, like John says, it's a culture that uh, the Kenya police has thrived in for decades. Um, the police, um, the, the working culture within the police is basically the problem that drives all these issues. Uh, if, if I take you back slightly to some of the issues that came, back, came out during the police vetting process, is that the, the junior officers on the roadblocks were collecting bribes because a lot of times they had been given targets by their bosses. And this money went high up. Uh, mm. Some of the senior officers who had been uh, vetted, actually the statements showed that they were receiving money on a daily basis from their juniors who are on roadblocks, uh, mostly, uh, of up to thousands of, of money that could be described as thousands of dollars per day. And some of that money, from our understanding, sometimes could find its way to some senior government officials. So it is a, it's a, it's a huge web. So this, this web needs a lot of political will to be able to break it. And two, <clears throat> a drastic shift of the policing culture in Kenya, like John says. Uh, and that policing culture is what initially was intended to be broken. But because of lack of political will, a bit, a bit of it was done half-heartedly. But then after that, I think people felt threatened because some of their interests were being exposed. Uh, and also a, a very independent police force was not very open to the direction from the executive. And that process stopped. I think people have now to begin to, to especially the leadership, to consider whether this kind of policing serves the interests of the country. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think where we are today, we are at a point where the leadership is willing to take the strong decision to ensure that the police change. And I doubt that despite mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the outrage that has followed the death or the killing of Sharif, this is going to trigger any, any, any major changes in the police. John Allen, uh, we just have a minute left. Let me, let me just get your final thoughts. I think um, the killing of Ashad Sharif is yet another point of reflection for the country um, about the state of our police, about the, the state of our own security, and an opportunity for members of the public, um, people in the civic space, but people in government, in the legislature as well, to really take a hard-eyed look at the problems that our police are fa uh, that are uh, faced within our police force, the rot that's inside the police force. I think this is an opportunity for 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 uh, the Kenyan police force to really reclaim um, or rebuild its image in, in the public's eye. I think that um, should they continue on the path that they are on now, 
of trying to obscure the facts of the of the killing of such an important journalist to Pakistan mm -hmm. and, and an important journalist to the journalism fraternity, then they will be doing not just themselves, but this country and the service. And um, anecdotally, at least, and even in terms of perception, further um, um, de decreasing um, Kenya's Kenya's standing in terms of press mm -hmm. freedom, in terms of media freedom. That this can happen to a journalist in Kenya is shameful. And that should never, that should never um, be forgotten. It is Agreed. a shame that a journalist can be killed in this way. John Alanamu, that will no. have to be the final word. I'd like to thank you and Otsiano Namwaya so much for being with me on this edition of The Newsmakers. Our viewers, of course, for being with us as well. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time. Thank you.